Well, good morning, good morning, and thanks again for being here. I'm Brian Agavino, the lead pastor. It's great to have you on this Palm Sunday. Like DJ mentioned, we've been in Mark since last September. We're going to take a little break uh, for the next three weeks and do kind of a separate series. We've got four words we're thinking about. We're thinking about remember, repent, resurrect, and restore. And so today we're going to remember Palm Sunday and remember actually a very famous, we're going to really be um, sticking to Zechariah 9.9 where the prophecy for Palm Sunday came from. But I want to read from you, for you this morning John chapter 12 where this is Jesus's we call triumphal entry into Jerusalem which started the week, the, his, the last week of his life before he went to the cross and then rose again. So I'm going to be in John chapter 12 or chapter 12, verse 12, and I want you to really listen for, I always like to give you something to think about, listen for, I want you to listen for the prophecy, just the simple words that Jesus fulfilled and how John draws it out, because we're just going to really hover in that specific verse today, it's verse 15. John wrote this, the next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he, was call, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Let's pray. Awesome God, what we know not, please teach us. What we have not, please give us, and what we are not. Today we ask boldly, please make us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Life is filled with things that seemingly don't go together, but when they are put together, become beautiful. Breakfast for dinner. Paper towels. I like that one. Think about that. Paper towels, right? I mean, sugared popcorn. Yeah, I'm not a fan either. But, you know, some people would say that's quite beautiful. Polka dots and stripes. Laughing so hard you cry. Chocolate covered pretzels. Oh, see, I wasn't even have to say I was today eight years old when I figured out how good that was. You guys already know how amazing that is. It's hard sometimes to comprehend two seemingly different things that when they come together as a both and as opposed to an either or can be so beautiful. Let me get a little more technical with you here. Light has a similar complexity. We see light every day and yet We don't really truly understand it. Technically, for a long time, people thought it was either a particle or a wave. But in 1905, Einstein made this hypothesis that they actually could be both at the same time. He said this, It seems as though we must use sometimes the one theory and sometimes the other, while at times we may use either. We are faced with a new kind of difficulty. We have two contradictory pictures of reality. Separately, neither of them fully explains the phenomena of light, but together they do. This hypothesis won Einstein a Nobel Prize, and very interestingly, I want to carry on the story because it's kind of cool. In 2015, 110 years later, Scientists and researchers were actually able to capture a picture of light that is both at the same time, waves and particles, and that's it. So the waves at the top, the particles at the bottom, 
is a really cool YouTube video about how they did it that dumbs it down for people like me. I'm not going to explain how they did the experiment, but it's a really cool thing. Again, scientists, to try to comprehend two very distinct and opposite things coming together as a both and instead of an either or can become beautiful. Around 500 BC, another statement was declared that seemed like an either or statement and not a both and statement. Israel had been released from exile to go and build the temple and the prophet Zechariah, who was encouraging them to this end and encouraging them about what was to come, wrote a seemingly contradictory statement. He said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The Jewish people struggled to comprehend what this means. Could it be possible that a king who was coming to liberate, who was coming to save, who was coming to redeem, could come humbly on a donkey. On a donkey. Two very contradictory thoughts. That there would be a king who would come with power and authority, but at the same time, they would come with humility and approachability and grace. There are actually commentaries out there written by rabbis that have wrestled with how can this truly be. Actually, in our text, it said that the disciples themselves didn't understand what had happened in that moment until after Jesus had rose from the dead. Well, it was a little over 500 years later when the reality of what seemed to be an either-or became a both-and. And its beauty would change the world. My friends, on this Palm Sunday, as we remember the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, the question before us is this. Do you have an either-or savior or a both-and savior? Do you have an either-or savior or a both-and savior? The difference will change everything about how you follow him. Let's see how. Let's begin by talking about the either-or savior, what that looks like for us. A few weeks ago, I was at a, actually uh, performing or uh, facilitating the wedding of a good friend of mine, and I was talking to his brother before the ceremony, and we got into an interesting conversation. He's a teacher in South County, and as we were engaging, I was just asking him about some different things at a very difficult school with middle schoolers, and I was like, man, you know, it's awesome that you're there doing that. I said, what made you want to do that? And he said, well, you know, it seems like the Christian thing to do. Knowing a little bit about my friend and his family, I said, oh, are you a Christian? And he said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I'm a full-on atheist. I, you know, I just, I'm just doing the Christian thing, I guess. And I was like, what does that even mean? And he said, he said, you know, I'm, I'm one of those, like, red-letter Jesus people. Like, I, I like all the things that he said in the red, but, um, you know, I'm like Gandhi. If it weren't for Christians, I might be a Christian. Oh, wow. I love that you guys are engaging with me today. This is an engaging sermon. I need you guys to be with me, especially at the end. We're going to get into this together. I loved having this conversation with him, and it struck me how he had somewhat of an either-or view of Jesus. And, and really, I, I wonder, and I really say this with grace, if he had ever read the red letters, that it's not really an either-or with Jesus, that it's not just grace and humility and gentleness, but there's this challenge and confrontation and this call to follow him with all of our lives and not just some of them. In fairness to my friend, I wonder if we too often see God and our Savior in an either or. 
that we approach him with an either-or perspective. I mean, think about this with me. Sometimes we want power, and sometimes we want vulnerability. When do we want God to be strong and powerful? Well, when we see things that are wrong in the world. When, when we're asking God, God, we see injustice. Where are you? Act. Come be powerful. Show who you are. Be the creator. Be the king. Be the righteous Lord. We want him to have justice when we look at others and their need for justice. Or we want him to be powerful when we want something accomplished. God, fix my marriage. Fix my boss. Solve my addiction. Change my situation. And when do we want him to be approachable or gentle or vulnerable? We want him to be approachable and gentle and vulnerable when we screw up. When our sin is apparent. When we really desperately need him to be patient with us. We want him to be gentle when we're struggling. When we're distant. And when we're disobedient. You see, when we see God in an either-or way, when we look at Jesus as an either-or way, we're actually missing the God of the Bible. The Savior of the Bible. I mean, think about it this way. What if he were the opposite? What if he did the opposite in those situations? What if when there was injustice He was just gracious. Or, you know, when there's injustice in the world and when we sinned against him, he he would just say, oh, okay, it's okay, don't worry about it. That that we limit God in his beauty when we do this. And, And think about it the other way. What if God were just when we were a mess? talk about that more in a little bit here, but we have to be honest about our struggle here. You see, when we think of God this way, we limit his beauty. And that's what the crowd was doing. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, they just wanted him to defeat Rome. They just wanted his power. But he's coming for something much greater. He doesn't just come with authority. He comes with vulnerability because only When he is both and, can he defeat our greatest needs, sin and death? The fact is, the reason we live in an either or world, I mean, let's be very honest about this. We we see all things, it's very hard for us to break out of this paradigm of either or. We, We often see things as good or bad, right or wrong. And I'm not necessarily arguing for a gray in this, but I'm, I'm just saying that when we look at things, it's either this way or that way, that God, you either need to be just or you need to be gracious, that God, you either need to be strong or you need, need to be approachable. And, and we struggle because if you think about how we engage with each other, we do the very same thing. In fact, we long for a leader who can be both. And up until Zechariah's statement, the world had never seen a leader like that. And until 500 years later, the world had never even comprehended of a leader like that. Because to lead in a both-and manner is an impossibility. Until a king fulfilled a prophecy until a king became a servant and came into the city and rode in on a donkey. Well, who is this king? He's a both-and savior. Let's unpack this if we can, the both-and savior. Today, I want to help us imagine the beauty of the both-and savior. I mentioned last week that I'm reading a book called Strong and Weak. It's by a thinker, preacher, uh, philosopher named Andy Crouch. He used to do campus ministry on Harvard University, and he has this great book called The Strong and the Weak. I'd recommend it to you. It's it's a great read. And he has this interesting concept that really uh, helps us understand this whole idea that helped me actually unpack this a little bit. And what he does is he talks about how we often see things 
one way or the other and how he was seeing that there was this idea that God somehow had authority but he was also vulnerable and he was trying to bring these two things together. So what he decided was sometimes we have to view it, at, we often view things linear, linearly, which is how we are often made, it's this or that or somewhere in between. But he brought to this idea that we need to add another dimension to it and look at more as a both and or a two-dimensional kind of way. And so he has this image, I want to show it to you, where he unpacks this idea of God, that instead of seeing it as a line with vulnerability and authority on, the, on one linear line, he creates, like I said, a two-dimensional two-by-two here, where he says there's authority and vulnerability. And what God is, is he's both and. The beauty of who he is is that he is both authority and vulnerability, and the perfect thing that he brings to bear for us is flourishing. And you can see how he fleshes this out. If you have authority without vulnerability, it leads to exploitation. That we get leaders who care only about them and what they want and pursuing us. This is what we do, right? When we want authority without being vulnerable, we exploit. When we are vulnerable without authority, when we have no power, we suffer. And then the other side of this, when we have no authority, no vulnerability, we withdraw. To have a God who is only powerful, scares us. To have a God who is only vulnerable leaves us anxious. Hear that again. To have a God who is only powerful, it scares us. And to have a God who is only vulnerable makes us anxious. But to have a God who is both powerful and vulnerable is exactly what we need. Let, let's think about this one more time. When I've sinned and I mess up and I go to him, if he's just approachable, what's the problem with that? He becomes just a weak and bad accountability group then. Right? That I go, oh Jesus, I messed up. What, what should I do? And he says, oh it's okay, I understand, I can be vulnerable, I relate, I know that it's hard, hang in there, buddy, good luck next time. And, and if Jesus is only powerful when I mess up, and then what happens? I don't go, I don't tell him, right? Because if I'm going to go to Jesus, if he's only authoritative and not vulnerable, he's going to what? Smite me is what he's going to do. He's going to be like, ching, let's get this guy out of here. Why can't he get it right? But if there's this beautiful picture that happens here where we have a powerful God and an approachable God, don't we see how those two things come together? That if, if in my heart I'm struggling with sin and I need, I'm saying, I need to go somewhere with this, where do I want to go? I want to go to someone who has the power to overcome and defeat sin. I want to go to someone who has the power to say, not only can you approach me and find grace and humble and humility here, but I want to be the one who has the power to actually save you and redeem you from sin. That we need both. That we need a God who can say, I will solve this problem for you. On Palm Sunday, because of a triumphant entry, we have a God who has the power to handle your struggles and the approachability to welcome you with them. That you can bring anything to him. And in that, he has the power to say, I can solve your greatest problem. In fact, it's because he solved our greatest problem that we can approach him. He is powerful and just, and he can make a way for you to come to him and welcome us like a father or a mother does a child with grace and approachability. In his famous book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, C.S. Lewis actually has a very powerful encounter that helps unpack this very concept and this idea where he, Mr. Beaver is talking about the godlike character Aslan. And he says this, Mr. Beaver says, safe? Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. A really profound and beautiful picture. Our God isn't safe, but he's good. 
He's a both and. He's beyond any power we could ever imagine. He is the ultimate extent, the extreme powerful that we could ever imagine. And at the same time, he is the most vulnerable, most gracious, most open God that we could ever imagine or think. He, he is the ultimate of all of those. Because why? Because he wants to bring our flourishing. He isn't safe, but he's good. I wonder today if you know him like that. I wonder today if you feel the freedom to come with your pain and your struggle and approach him with complete vulnerability because he welcomes you, knowing that in his power he made a way for you to come. I I would venture to say that for those of us who don't frequently bring our sin before God, probably see him as higher on the authority scale. That, that, that really is more of our struggle, that part of the church and what we've done is we've trained our hearts to say, God's just a taskmaster. He's about rules. I wonder if that's you this morning. I wonder if today you could ask God to show you the beauty of a both and Savior. Well, now the challenge of that is that it changes us into a both and people. It changes us into a both and people. There's some pretty significant implications for us as a church if God is both and, if our Savior is both and. Because we tend to be either or people. But if we're mirrors of the king, mirrors of the servant, if we're pointing people to his kingdom, then we will wrestle through how to be the same. Let me flesh this out a little bit if I can. If we're going to follow Jesus, simply put, we cannot fight the way the world fights. We cannot use their tools to get the means that we want. Palm Sunday challenges us to consider whether we've adopted the efficiency of force or the convenience of abandonment instead of the way of Jesus. Both and people reject the way of violence and instead love those we disdain. Both and people reject the way of abandonment and we fight for the marginalized and the weak. Are we people of violence, of force, or do we put that aside And follow Jesus into the city, knowing what love demands of us. Are we people of avoidance? Or do we put it aside and follow Jesus into the city, knowing what flourishing demands of us? Both and people have tough skin and a tender heart. A both and people are wise as serpents and harmless as doves. A both and people will be fierce to the ultimate degree and meek and sensitive and gracious to the ultimate degree. A both and people will be brave and will be sweet. A both and people will be totally under control and recklessly loving. The application today, church, is challenging because it is so much easier to be either or. We have to take the risk to press into each other and the Holy Spirit to challenge our thinking about how to be a truly both and people. It's actually a discipline, I would argue. That it will be more natural for you to, and me, to respond in ways with either authority or vulnerability. And, And what we need to ask ourselves and push each other to and ask the Spirit to really lead us into is how do I become both and people? How do I parent as a both and parent? How do I love my neighbor as a both and neighbor? 
How do I care for those who don't know Jesus in a both-and way? In order to be a both-and people, we would need a beautiful both-and leader, wouldn't we? One who displayed some of the most opposite complexities in the most beautiful fashion. We would need someone who is both king and a servant, a paradoxical union of two seemingly incompatible natures. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We would need someone who is both fully God and fully man, a paradoxical union of two seemingly incompatible natures. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We would need someone who is both the lion and the lamb, a paradoxical union of two seemingly incompatible natures. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I need you guys, come on. We would need someone who is both alpha and omega, a paradoxical union of two seemingly incompatible natures. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We would need someone who is both a judge and a savior, a paradoxical union of two seemingly incompatible natures. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we would need someone who is both a high priest and a sacrifice, a paradoxical, seemingly contradictory of two natures. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we would need someone who is both death and resurrection. Next week. (laughs) Next week, you guys. Church, we have a both and king. This is our king. Powerful, approachable, and beautiful. Do you see him? Do you see him? He comes riding on a donkey as your king. So as we begin Holy Week... Let us not just be in awe of him and his beauty. Let us ask that he would transform us into both and people as well. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Almighty God, you knew this day would come when your son would enter in And he would be the both and Savior. Today, would our reflection and remembrance of him transform us into both and people. We say together, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen and amen.